I am the Reverend Catherine McDonald, and you'll notice that I do not have my trusty sidekick with me this morning. We are going to miss Jesse, aren't we? Jesse was our student minister for the last year and a half, and uh, her time with us is finished. However, we're trusting that she will come back to visit with us on occasion. Uh, Byron Herman is our music director. Ryan Gomez is our reader this morning, and Jack and Nellie are on live stream. Welcome to those of us, those of you who are worshiping with us on Zoom or Facebook Live. Wherever we gather, however we gather, we are a community together. As we gather in this place, we are mindful that in Nova Scotia, we gather on unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And so may we live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its people. A special welcome back to a couple of people who are returning from south. Um, Beth Brogan over here on this side and Irma McDonald on this side, Arizona and Florida respectively, I think. And we have another welcome back from Cuba, but he's been in and out so often, Grant. <laughs> Good to have you back with us though. As always, when we gather, we gather in the name of Jesus. And so we light a candle as a symbol of the light came into the world in creation. We light it as a symbol of the light that was more fully revealed in Jesus Christ. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness will never overcome it. And we light our pride candle. Also the colors of our mission and service fund signifying that all genders, all sexual orientations are welcome here. And also that our light and our love extend to all humanity and to the world beyond this place. Our opening song of celebration, Byron's Ready to Lead. Yes, and uh, a joyful rejoice. Don't forget to have some nice rejoicing and clapping. Just a clapping hands ready. Rejoice in the Lord all <coughs> and again I say. All right, now that Byron's warmed up your clapping hands, we also have a clapping exercise in the call to worship. So in your response on every syllable, I want you to clap. So when I say in this place and you respond with God shows up, it's God shows up, okay? Enthusiastically, right? <laughs> so in this place, in this place, God shows up, we show up, come let us worship, awesome. And now we're just going to take it down a notch. Even as we rejoice and celebrate, and in that rejoicing and in celebrating, we be before God with assurance, with that calm awareness that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And so with that sure knowledge, we can confess our shortcomings, the times that we fall short of God's dream for us. So let us pray. God of new life and new possibilities, 
God of conversion and transformation, we confess that we get stuck in our own way of doing things and are blind to other openings and opportunities. We confess that we forget that our view is restricted in ways that we are not aware of, and sometimes, perhaps often, fail to see your wider vision for us. Forgive us, enliven us, inspire us. We turn to you, knowing that you understand us, forgive us, and love us like a mother. And so we pray with confidence and faith. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to rise in body or rise in spirit, and we will sing our opening hymn, Holy Spirit, Truth Divine. Well, good morning. Reverend Catherine forgot to let me sing again. Sometimes I get so annoyed with her. Anybody else? Yes? Get annoyed with her? <sighs> hmm. Are you taking notes? <laughs> so she asked me a question earlier. She asked me whether anybody had ever heard a call from God.
Anybody? I see Nellie nodding her head. Does Nellie want to tell me about that? No. <laughs> Put you on the spot, right, Nellie? Are you all a little shy? Yes. What about you, Reverend Catherine? You must have heard God's call. Well, you hope I did, right? <laughs> Would you like me to tell you about it? <laughs> that better be God calling. <laughs> Whose phone is ringing? It's for me, it's God, right? <laughs> so I, I will tell you a little bit about my call from God because we're talking about a call, we're talking about call conversion and community this morning in my in my reflection. So I, I felt God's call on my life ever since I was a child, um, but because I'd never experienced a woman in ministry, I really never thought that ministry was open to me. It just wasn't something that crossed my mind. But one day, I started going to church as a young adult, or as a young 30s, early 30s woman. And one day, I was going to some meeting or some event at the church, and I was traveling down Coal Harbor Road, not the road to Damascus, like Paul, <laughs> but Coal Harbor Road. But as you know, Paul probably wrote, wrote, went down that road to Damascus more than once, too. And all of a sudden, it struck me. A bolt of lightning? No. But it struck me. My son was 18. And he was making plans to go to university. And he was making plans for his life. And for the very first time in my adult life, I could start making plans about how I would like the rest of my life to unfold without him being my first consideration. And this sense that, you know, those little um, wooden puzzles that only fit together one way. And I thought, I want to see, I want to explore a call to ministry. And those, the, all those little pieces kind of just locked into place but the thing about god's call is that it's not just a call to one person right i did experience that call very strongly on that very mediocre road driving by i think it was what's now the superstore i think it was iga then um but then it was tested in community it was tested by the community of Coal Harbor, and then it was tested by the wider church to see whether God was indeed calling me into ministry in the United Church. Well, Catherine, that's quite a story. It is quite a story. God does call us, perhaps not into ordained ministry, but God calls us, and God calls us to test that in community. God converts our hearts, converts our souls, and wherever two or three are gathered, he is with us, right? Well, Reverend Catherine, that was a bit more solemn than you usually are. <laughs> You're right. Shall I spice it up next time? Yes. Okay.
Will you join me in a moment of prayer? May these words, offered with humility and hope, draw us closer to you, O God, and one another. Amen. I sat in my study at home yesterday and pictured myself as a parishioner, not necessarily here at stairs, but pondered what I might need to hear this morning. As a preacher, I'm conscious that most weeks there are a variety of needs and desires on a Sunday morning, depending on circumstances, personal circumstances, um, on personality, and what is going on in the world. Would I need to hear a word of hope, of challenge, of comfort, of assurance, something else? What might you be looking for on a Sunday morning? And that's not a rhetorical question. You could respond. And for those of you on Zoom or Facebook Live, if you want to say something in the comments or on the chat, that would be great too. What is it you look for on Sunday morning when you come here? Reassurance. Reassurance. Fellowship. Fellowship. Music. Music. Inspiration. Friendship. Friendship. Hope. Hope. Peace. Peace. Story shared. No. Jokes. <laughs> well, I'm going to a workshop called Preaching Punchlines. <laughs> Anything on Facebook Live or, or Zoom? Okay. Today's reading is from the book of Acts. It's one of the accounts of Paul's conversion from a, being a persecutor of Jesus' followers to becoming one of the most ardent and zealous of Jesus' followers. And just for fun, I Google mapped the distance between Jerusalem and Damascus, Damascus, which is in Syria. It's 271 kilometers. And according to Google, it's 56 hours of walking. And although this account of Paul's conversion often has Paul falling off his horse. There is actually no horse in the story. The horse might be assumed, um, and Google Maps doesn't offer horseback as an option. So 271 kilometers, it's not a long distance in our terms, right? It's three hours of driving on a decent highway, but significant in Paul's time, a few days journey at least. And he's not traveling alone. He's with a number of other men. Now, this account takes place after Paul had stood by the stoning of Stephen. Stephen, who was stoned to death and martyred. And Paul had gone house to house, dragging Jesus' followers, dragging men and women out of their houses and imprisoning them. So listen closely to these words of an almost unbelievable conversion in Acts 9. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from the heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city and you will be told what to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice, but they saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days, he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. 
Now, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Taurus named Saul. At that moment, he is praying, and he has seen a vision, and a man named Ananias came in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man and how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here has the authority from the chief of priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before the Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. He then got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength, and for several days, he was with his disciples in Damascus. There is a lot going on in those 19 verses, isn't there? A couple of key things stood out for me. Paul has this staggering experience, blinded by a bright light. A voice who claims to be Jesus, instructions to go into Damascus and wait for further word. Now, Paul is a devout Jew. And while Paul is the central character in this story, I'm not sure that he is the most important one. Ananias is a follower of Jesus living in Damascus, and when Jesus calls him, he responds that with the words that we hear so often in Scripture. We hear them so often when God calls ordinary people. Did you pick up on them? Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Four short words. Four short words that mean, I'm here, what do you need me to do? When he tells them, however, he argues with Jesus a bit. Did you notice that? <laughs> and don't we do that too? <laughs> you ever argue with God? Or with Jesus when one of them gives you a nudge about something? I know I certainly do. Because after all, Paul has been one of the most zealous of persecutors of Jesus' followers. Why on earth would Ananias risk being anywhere near him? But his role, Ananias' role, is the crucial one, because without him, there is no conversion story. For a call and a conversion to another way of life does not happen in solitude. It only happens in community. Paul had that experience on the road without the willingness of Ananias to meet him, to lay hands on him, and allow him into the community of believers. There would be no conversion. Have any of you seen that video, little video clip? of a, one man dancing all alone on a hillside. It looks like there might be at a concert of some sort. Um, so there's this, I'll try and describe it to you. I will be so glad when we get our new AV system on in that we can actually show a video clip. So I, did I promise dancing today? I, I think I did with the choir earlier, didn't I? So this man is dancing, like he's, He's dancing and he's all alone. There's people sitting down. There's people walking by and he's dancing out there all alone by himself. 
And then suddenly somebody comes to join him. He's looking like a fool pretty much by himself, right? And then the first person shows him the moves. They're simple moves. And then there's two of them dancing, doing the same moves. And then the second one gestures for another person to join in. We, we, if we had to rehearse this, if I'd come to choir practice, we could have done this. Of course, I would actually have to write my sermon before Saturday then. <laughs> but then a third and a fourth, and suddenly the entire hillside is dancing. Everybody is joining in. And it's not just because the first person got up and looked like a fool. Yes, we need that first person to get up and risk looking like a fool, risk doing something different. But the second person is crucial. Because if that first person is just standing there all alone and nobody joins, they're just a first person looking like a fool, right? That first, second person, and that third person. And that's why I think Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. So what does this have to do with anything that we're struggling with in our world today? Think of the movements that started because one person was willing to look foolish and start something or propose something that went against the prevailing established order. I mean, well, <laughs> you're looking at one now. We didn't used to ordain women, right? Even though we've been ordaining women for a long time, we didn't used to ordain women. And lots of denominations still don't. We've got an example sitting in the parking lot the idea of car sharing 25 years ago was unheard of. The idea of everybody owning a car was the norm, right? And we've only had car sharing in HRM since 2015. It's not that long ago, right? Eight years or seven years? I can math. It took somebody willing to go against the popular notion that owning a car was normal and think of a different way for people to experience owning a car. But one person's idea wouldn't have gone, gone far, would it? Think of the local food mo movement or even buying local. That had to start with somebody putting forth that idea and then somebody else getting on board until buying local food is fairly a common idea now. And both of those have a huge environmental impact, right? And with the price of diesel at what, $2.53 a liter, I think? And most of our food traveling 1,200 kilometers before it hits our plate? the cost of food is only going to increase. Eating local is one way that we can support our local farmers and reduce environmental impact. Think about slavery. The Bible was used to justify slavery for years. There were individuals who at great risk spoke up against it. But until there was that second person and that third person, until it became a movement, and even though racism still impacts people of color today, at least here in North America and much of the world, we've had a complete conversion of the idea of that owning people is wrong. Refugee sponsorship. One person had a spark of an idea here, right? We can do this. Somebody else said, yes, yes, we can do this. And a group of you got together and said, yes, we can do this. And you did it and you're doing it. The final point I wanna make is this, that blinding flash of light that period of fasting that Paul experienced, that laying on of hands by Ananias, 
all of those were incomplete. It was only when Paul was drawn into the of violence to the way of Jesus. And Jesus is that guy dancing on the hill. He's inviting us to follow him, to be that second person or that third person or the fourth or fifth, and to invite others into the dance, to be called and converted and claimed into community. And can I get a hallelujah and an amen? Thanks be to God. So I can't let that go without talking a little bit about my call to music ministry. Back in uh, when I was a teenager, I was called to uh, the seminary, the Catholic seminary, and studied for four years to the priesthood. And uh, then uh, found that music was more my my thing. So I continue to uh, to serve the God through my music ministry at various churches uh, in around the seminary. And then I've been fortunate to travel many places around the world to share that great gift that God has given me to a, a worldwide community. And uh, of course, I find myself back here. Uh, not back here, but for the first time into this part of Canada, into stairs. And that music ministry has just been with me. And part of that uh, great uh, talent that the Lord has given me is to write music and to be able to share that with, with uh, our community and, of course, with our choir. Uh, today, we have a, a new hymn uh, written uh, for Earth Day. It's called uh, Listen to the Song of Mother Nature. And uh, this song was actually been written been in writing for almost eight years but have the final version now and it and we're going to sing the the choir version with uh, and hopefully the congregation will join in uh, sometime in the future there's also a version with uh, children's choir uh, dancing uh, indigenous drum and um, also uh, hand actions so it's uh, accessible for many people um, those who are listening on Zoom and Facebook, uh, we don't have a good uh, choir audio pickup of sound uh, of the singing, so you'll need to just uh, follow the words uh, on the screen uh, together with the music that you'll hear, and we'll, we'll work on getting a, a little better sound of the choir and congregation into the live worship. So uh, we're going to sing, listen to the song of Mother Nature.
And neither Byron or I were called to, you know, um, technology ministry. <laughs> Much as we have relied on Byron um, greatly over the last couple of years as we rely on Jack and Nellie. Uh, let us stand if you are able and we will sing together. Today we are all called to be disciples.
And I would invite you to remain standing for our new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has creating and is who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us, we are not alone. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Can you imagine the military breaking into your home in the middle of the night, arresting and detaining your child, and then taking them away to be interrogated? This happens nightly in Palestine. It happened to Khalil, a teenager who lives in Sheikh Jarrah, a neighborhood of occupied East Jerusalem. Last June, Khalil was simply standing with his mother outside their home when he says he was attacked and assaulted by Israeli police passing by and detained for two days before being released on bail and placed on house arrest. Even though house arrest has been lifted, he still lives in constant fear. When I go to school, I'm constantly worried about my family. When I pass through the checkpoints at the entrances to our neighborhood, whether I'm on my way to school or I'm returning, I feel as though I'm in a big prison. He says this in a photo essay that he shares about his experience. Khalil's essay was just released by Defense for Children International or DCIP. Your generosity through mission and service supports this advocacy organization in defending children's rights by offering free legal aid, documenting violations of international law, advocating for greater protections. Although Israel ratified the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1991, DCIP says that Palestinian children like Khalil continue to be systematically denied protections. Last year, 78 children were killed as a result of Israeli military and settler presence in the occupied Palestinian territory. On May 5th to the 8th of this year, this week, the United Network for Justice and Peace in Palestine and Israel is hosting a conference in London, Ontario called Responding to a Cry for Hope. The event will be largely led by Palestinian speakers sharing their own experiences the Reverend Marianna Harris, a United Church minister, is one of the organizers of the event. She says, I've been involved in this work since 2002 when I heard what was going on in Palestine, and it's completely shocked me. Since then, I've been to Palestine three times. I have friends there, and what's happening there is just not right. Harris encourages mission and service supporters to take the next step and connect with the UNJPPI. I would encourage people to learn more about what is happening and what we're doing by visiting their website, which is unjppi.org. She says, join Canadians who are standing up for the rights of Palestinians. Their hurting has to stop. I believe good can happen and we're called to make it happen. We are called. We are invited to participate in ministry that empowers rather than overpowers. We are invited to share God's gifts in ways that bring healing and wholeness. The offering box is at the back and will be brought forward in a moment. If you missed it on your way in, there's an offering plate that will remain there on a way out. 
Your gifts transform and save lives. They inspire meaning and purpose and build a better world, both through the ministries of this community and through, through mission and service. Knowing this, let us be generous in our giving, with our love, with our time, and with our money. I invite you to stand as you are able and we'll sing our offering song. Gracious and loving God, bless the gifts we offer for the ministries of this community and for mission and service, and help us live more closely attuned to the way of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. And let us once again come together as a community of faith in prayer. God of forgiveness and new beginnings, we give you thanks for this new day, for opening our eyes to each new morning, for reminding us that Christ is always risen. We give you thanks for shine and for rain, for morning and evening, for starlight and moonlight, and yes, for electric lights too. We give you thanks for simple meals and extravagant feasts, for music and dancing, for silence and solitude, for hugs from friends and smiles from strangers for walks in the park and the bustle of city streets. God of healing and new hope. Our gratitude for all these gifts reminds us of the broken empty places that still remain both near and far away. The endless aching need of the world is beyond what human hands can fill, and so we pray that you will provide what we cannot. We pray that you will guide those who make decisions and that you will protect those who live under their rule. We pray for those who live in fear of violence and for those who make them feel afraid. We pray for those who live in mansions and for those who live on the street. We pray for those who have too little and for those who have too much. We pray for those who live in sickness and in pain and those who find ways to bring them relief. We pray for those who have asked us to pray and for those we cannot, who cannot pray for themselves. And we pray for our own needs and weakness. And we pray what is written on our hearts. And all God's people said, Amen. So a few, a few things from the life and work of the faith community to share. 
those of you who were, have been wondering about Gordon McCaskill's celebration of life or memorial service that is taking place here at Stair on August the 6th at 2 p.m. That's a Saturday. And um, there is a, a celebration of life happening in Ontario as well, but the family has asked whether something could take place here. And of course, um, I said yes. And uh, so that is August the 6th at 2 p.m. Thank you to those folks who have um, sent in photographs already and uh, we'll continue to do that through the, the coming weeks uh, for the, the church photo directory and uh, we'll just keep on adding to them. Hopefully we'll get that complete before the end of June. Uh, on the 15th, we're having a hymn sing. So we've announced this the last couple of Sundays, we're having a hymn sing. So if you have a favorite hymn that you would like us to sing, I need to know it by next Monday. So that's a week from tomorrow. You can email me, text me, call me, but I need to know it by next Monday because Tamara only works Monday and Tuesday. So that only leaves me Tuesday to work on the bulletin. If you call me after that, guess what? <laughs> You're gonna be out of luck. So next Monday. Um, the same day on the 15th, we're gonna have a shared ministry gathering. We haven't had one for a while just to keep folks, uh, get folks up to date with what's been going on in uh, behind the scenes. There has been lots going on behind the scenes. Uh, so a light lunch will be served immediately following worship. And we think we're gonna do it right up here, right, Sandra? Um, so that there's less movement, we'll have lunch and the gathering right up here. And that way we can easily broadcast it to those who are uh, on Zoom. We won't Facebook Live it, but we will broadcast it on Zoom. And uh, we're having a community free market exchange was the ne my next slide. Yes, I think. And then, oh, I have my slides backwards. Um, June 4th, which is still a month away, but if you've got items that you want to give away, think about them now. And then stroll for your soul. That's uh, something that we've done or offered every year since I've been here. If you want to sign up to receive an email uh, every morning for three weeks, uh, just let me know. I'll put you on the list. And it comes automatically from Janice McLean. Uh, she's a United Church minister who has an online ministry called The Prayer Bench. Is there anything else that needs to be shared from the congregation? A week from this Monday at UCW at 1.30 downstairs or up here or somewhere. On, uh, okay, both in person and on Zoom. Great. All right, then, as we talked about call, conversion, and community, we're going to sing Draw the Circle Wide as we draw people into community. I invite you to stand as you are able. <clears throat>
go out into the world knowing that God loves you. Go out into the world knowing that God calls you and claims you and converts you and calls you into community with one another. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the community of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you this day and always. Amen.